He says, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. In other words, listen guys, God does not allow anything to come upon us as Christians that he, that he has not, that the devil, in other words, he can't do anything to you that has not already been taken through God's filter. Amen. And God allows it sometimes in order to test us, in order to grow us up, in order to mature us. I don't like it, but I tell you what, it's the only way I've ever grown when I've gone through the hard times of life. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. And then you here just pleaded for, for, for something from God before? Oh, Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't know why I keep doing it. Please help me. I don't want to do this anymore. Anybody besides me ever done that? Yeah. But he said to me, now listen, are you ready? My grace is sufficient for you. Did you hear that? In other words, when you're going through the trials of life, he says, my grace. Now listen, grace is not just what we talk about, uh, you know, and, we, we're hope, and I think we're really doing a, a better job and a good job of actually explaining grace to you. It's not just the unmerited favor of God. We don't deserve God's kindness, his gift of salvation, but he gives it anyway. Praise God for that kind of grace. But the grace he's talking about here is the other part of grace that is the empowerment by the Holy Spirit that he gives us in order to walk a godly life. He says, my grace, my empowerment in your life is sufficient for you to get through this. Now, you can't do it without his empowerment. You'd be like I was at times, just a bubbling idiot on the ground. Right? You ever been there? My grace is sufficient for you for my power. Now, whose power? His power. Not your power. Sometimes as Christians, we try to bull through, through things on our own strength, using our own human reasoning. I'm going to tell you right now, that's where you're going to fail. You and I are not smart enough to get through things on our own. We have got to have something greater than us, and it is God's power in our life. And that word power is dunamis, which means the, the same type of power, dynamite power, that was used to raise Jesus from the dead. That's the kind of power he says that he gives to each one of us. In order to get through these weaknesses that we have, or the life situations we find ourselves in. Are you with me? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In other words, I can't really show my power until you admit that you're weak and you call out to me. Right. Amen. I'm struggling here, Lord. I thought I had your power. Now, how do you get his power? By trusting him to do it and quit doing it yourself. Right. He can't make his power evident in your life until you just give up and you give him complete control. But as long as you try to do it yourself, his power is not going to become evident. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Why? So that Christ's power may rest on me. Did you hear that? <laughs> that his power will rest on me. Isn't that incredible? God's power can rest on everyone in this room. Why? Because you admit that you're weak and you need him more than anything else. But this is good stuff. Amen. Half of you ought to be running around the building shouting. He said, that is why for Christ's sake, for whose sake? Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses. I don't know about you, but I have had a hard time delighting in my weaknesses. <laughs> Ooh, I'm so happy that I got this area of my life that I just have to struggle with all the time. <laughs> now, the delight comes in the fact that you know that when you're weak, God is going to have you, he's going to move in with his power and it's going to rest on you and get to serve it. That's where the delight comes in. See, there's a difference. And listen, that is, <laughs> oh, this is good. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, which is our own fleshly shortcomings, in insults. How many have been happy to have just been insulted? <laughs> I didn't see anybody raise their hand on that one. <laughs> Thank you for that insult. I delight. Because now God's power rests on me. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> I 
I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships. Anybody ever gone through a hardship before? Yeah, we're always going through them, right? In persecutions, in difficulties. Now, this is Paul talking. Listen, Paul was a man just like you and I are, are men and women too. When I say man, I'm talking about humankind. He experienced the same sort of junk you and I go through. Insults, difficulties, hardships, weaknesses. Because he says, for when I am weak, <laughs> then I am strong. Then I am strong. Wow. So that brings me to our three points this morning. <laughs> And you thought we were done, didn't you? Man, we can go out on that alone, couldn't we? That's great stuff. That's the Word of God. The Word of God is so powerful, isn't it? I want to talk to you this morning about three things that determine our life for Christ. You ready for number one? And so say amen. amen. Number one, the changes that you are willing to make. That's going to determine our life for Christ. The changes you are willing to make. Oh, this is a tough one for a lot of people in the church today. Willing to change. I don't like change. How come we don't? We used to do it like this. I don't like change. And what they're really saying is, it's not the stuff around them that they don't like change. They don't want to change. You understand what I'm saying? The changes that you are willing to make. Listen, if you and I are going to, you know, walk with Christ and have our lives be everything he wants it to be, you and I are going to have to change some things. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2 says this. Therefore, or in other words, I urge you, brothers and sisters. Now, who is he talking to when he says brothers and sisters? Us. He's not talking to sinners. He's talking to believers. He says, I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. In other words, as you are looking at God's mercy on your life. I want you to just think about that for a minute. What is God's mercy? His mercy is that you deserve hell, but instead he gives you heaven and you didn't deserve it, right? I mean, look at that right now. He says, while you're viewing that, here's what I want to urge you to do. Because see, when you view something and you begin to see the, the significance of it and the power of it, it'll help you to understand and do what you need to do. He says, I urge you is view of God's mercy to offer your bodies. What does that mean? It means you're making a change. Some people aren't willing to offer anything. He says, I want you to offer your bodies. What does that mean? That means, here I am, Lord. Here I am. Lock, stock, and barrel. Every part of me. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? Here I am. It ain't about me anymore. It's about you. See, that's the first change that has to be made. We have to offer our bodies to Christ. Let me ask you, did he not offer his body to you and I? Unconditionally, didn't he? He gave himself up on the cross so that you and I could have eternal life. So we could go to that same third heaven that Paul went to where you can't even begin to express what is there. Think about it. Offer your bodies as living sacrifice. In other words, you're still going to be walking around in this body. You're a living sacrifice, though. You're, what's the sacrifice? I'm sacrificing my body for Christ. I'll go where you want me to go. Do what you want me to do. Too many people in the church today are not willing to make that change. 